Hello. In the last lecture, we went over some basic definitions, including what are traditional machine learning methods and what are physics-informed machine learning methods. Um, the four case studies that we're going to uh, learn in this um, lectures, case study on heat transfer, case study on chemical reactions, a case study on 3D printing, and case study on adhesive failure. Some baseline traditional machine learning approaches that we're going to review and we're going to learn in this course. And some mach physics informed machine learning techniques that are going to enhance those uh, traditional approaches to capture the underlying physics much better. In this lecture, we're going to go over a simple example. And I have this simple example for a very specific reason, and that is when you have small data. Um, many people are not convinced the machine learning methods are a good approach for small data sets, especially physical data sets. Um, here I have a simple example that I will go over two non-machine learning approaches comparing with uh, traditional machine learning approaches without um, enforcing any physics. In fact, there is no physics here, it's just mathematics. Everything that we're going to um, use are provided in this Python code, which is ML. Um, intro.py, and I'm not going to go over the details of that code, uh, but on that code, you can go and um, you can see how these have been implemented and uh, how you can do different scenarios as I'm going to walk you through this in this um, lecture. So imagine we have a simple example. There is an unknown function that takes two inputs, x and y, and then you have z as an outcome. Um, you don't know that function, and imagine that doing those iterations are expensive. So you can change x and y, and you can ask what is the z value, but you don't want to do that too many times, because as I mentioned before, doing experiments are expensive, so you have limited data. To make it um, more confined, let's say the x and y are defined between minus 18 and 10, both of them. The units are not important. The underlying function is not important. But we're going to see three different techniques to achieve one outcome. The goal is to find a single x and y where the z value goes above 175. Um, so the goal is to find a single value, a single location of x and y, input experiments, where the outcome of the experiments becomes large. Um, this example doesn't have a unique solution. There might be many uh, combination of X and Y to give you that outcome. But we're going to try three different techniques um, that are widely used in applications. And we're going to see why at least the traditional machine learning approaches might be better compared to these other non-machine learning approaches. Okay, so um, again, two inputs, X and Y, measuring one output, Z. And finding an x and y such that z becomes more than 175 while keeping x and y between minus 18 and 10. The first approach, which you might have tried it yourself, but you don't know probably the name of it, is called one factor at a time or OFAT. It's a very simple approach. It says you have several parameters that are varying. Let's define a center point. In this case, uh, let's set x and y are minus 4 in the middle of the minus 18 and 10 domain. Keep all the parameters constant. In this case, keep, keep x constant and vary y. Or keep the other parameter constant and vary the other, uh, keep the other parameters constant and one more one vary all these parameters, one factor at a time. It's, if you think about it, it's like you pick a point in a domain and you take local derivatives around that point. So this is how you can visualize this, and this is how the test has been done. So first, you start by selecting um, a single point. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, which is minus 4, minus 4 in the middle of the domain. And you ask the function to give you the z value. The z value is uh, somewhere around minus 3, if you can see here. And then there are two curves that are plotted here. One of them is where the x is constant minus 4. The other one is where y is constant minus 4. And then you vary the other parameters. In total, you're doing nine tests here, one baseline. And once you keep x constant, you vary y. 
two on right and two on left. And the, the other one also the same. So overall, you're doing eight more iterations or nine iterations. And then you plot all the values here. So the blue lines is where the x is constant and you're varying y between minus 18 and 10. And the z shows the values that have measured. And the yellow line is for the other parameter. If you do this, um, you will get a maximum z out of all of these 19, which is um, minus 0.3. It's far off from 1.75. But of course, I designed the example such that this method is not successful in this specific example. Sometimes it might be successful. But you can see that if the number of inputs go well beyond two, if you have like 10 variables, this becomes a very difficult exercise. Having said that, in application, this is a widely used method. Even though we have much better tools, this is the simplest way of doing things, so it's something that is widely used. In the, in the Python code, there is an option parameter at the beginning. If you set option equal to 2 and run it, you will get these two curves. And you can go through the code and see how um, this is done. Again, I'm not going to go through the Python coding and the introduction. I'll go more into the Python coding in the subsequent lectures for the case studies. The next example is a bit more advanced statistical method called design of experiments, or DOE. And um, this is a well-established approach, and I'm not going to go into details of that. Here we are using a subset approach called a central composite design, or CCD. In this approach, it says, look at your domain. And I love this example because you can represent this in 3D. You have X and Y and Z. Still, it's, um, you can comprehend. Um, the shape, but if it goes beyond two inputs and one output, you cannot visualize it anymore. But if you look at the domain, X and Y, this approach says, take the points at the corner of the domain, and then select the middle, which are between minus 9 and 10, and then select the, the, the central point of your domain, which is minus 4 and 4, minus 4 and minus 4. And then evaluate the function and all of these nine locations for these two parameters. And you can see the z values that are plotted here. And again, you're selecting nine points that are around your domain and center of your domain. If you do this, you will get a z value, which is um, 0.56. It's an improvement over previous one. It still doesn't give you 1.75. Um, to further go beyond this initial nine points, you can start dividing this into sub-categories. So you get one corner of the domain. You divide it into more points and more points and more points. Every time you're doing that, you can also fit a surface. So this is where it becomes a bit more um, advanced compared to the previous method, because you can actually visualize what's going to happen in your domain if you have 3D data, of course. Um, the the Z, maximum Z value doesn't change, but at least it shows you that your domain is not a simple linear domain. Um, so it's more complex. This method, again, uh, the DOE, or design experiments, is of course is a more advanced statistical method compared to previous methods, but might not be efficient if you want to minimize how many data you have to gather, or work with the data that we already have. So in the ML intro code, if you set option equal to three and run the code, um, you will get this outcome. This is a direct outcome of the code. The next example is going to be through a very specific machine learning algorithm called GPR. And if you're not familiar with GPR, it's not important. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to go over the basics of GPR, Gaussian process regression. But I'm going to walk you through what it does. So it's a probabilistic approach, but we're going to run it in a step-by-step -step approach. The way it works is something like this. It says, look at your domain, select four or five initial points. It could be random, or it could be um, at the corner of your domain. Here it has been done randomly. So select four and five points randomly in this case, and fit a probabilistic surface. So there is a mean surface, and there is your understanding of how, um, what is the certainty around your prediction. So there are, uh, there are actually two gray uh, surfaces around uh, the color surface in the middle. That's the confidence zone, which we're going to again explain what that is. Um, so this gives you baseline information. With the four tests, five tests you have done, this is your understanding of this domain. This gives you a z-value of minus 0.37. 
Next, the algorithm goes and tries to find the location that it thinks is going to maximize the value of the function. So you can see that it goes through iterations, iteration 6, iteration 8, iteration 10. In every iteration, it goes and tries to find the location of the maximum and do the test in that location. This is like a targeted test. Um, compared to the DOE, it's a targeted test and it's an iterative, this iterative approach. So you can go a step by step and you can stop the process once you achieve your goal. And it's not um, perfectly um, at the corners of the domain. The algorithm might push you toward different areas that it thinks you have the maximum chance of increasing the Z value. And then finally, after 11 iteration in this example, you will arrive at um, a specific location that the value of Z goes to 1.84 beyond 1.75, your, um, your goal. In ml.entro, if you set the option equal 4, it will take you through this process. But if you run it several times, every time it takes more iterations to arrive at an answer. The reason is that it very much depends on some assumptions that you make in machine learning models, which I'm going to tell you those assumptions. Um, and also, the initial points that you're selecting. So it's the initial points and the parameter of this uh, machine learning algorithm. We call this a theory agnostic machine learning. It doesn't understand anything about the underlying, um, if there was physics involved, it's pure data fitting. But um, you can see the, um, that in some cases, this might become a lot more successful than the previous one in minimizing the number of tests you have to do to achieve your goal. Um, again, it's true iteration and it's true targeted evaluation of the function. In the code, if you set option equal to 1, it shows you the, it shows you the hidden underlying truth, uh, which is a complex sinusoidal shape, and it has peaks and valleys. And if you can see, the corner that we found with the machine learning model is in this area, but it has other areas where the value goes much higher than 1.75. Um, so the machine learning model had a chance to find multiple locations. And that's why if you run it multiple times, you might arrive at different um, areas. The ma absolute maximum value of the function in this domain is 3.17. So in comparison, you had OFAT, which was one factor at the time, DOE, which is design of experiments. In this case, the probabilistic machine learning approach, which is Gaussian process regression, or GPR, which relies on iteration and targeted evaluation of a function. And again, we are not enforcing any physics here. This is just pure um, comparison of traditional approaches, statistical approaches, applied approaches like OFAT, and machine learning approaches. In the next um, part of this lecture, for the introduction, we will go over some of the basic um, understanding of these algorithms, neural network, Gaussian process regression, and ensemble methods. And again, without involving physics for this introduction series.